I'd like to express appreciation for the good, well-organized student leadership and music and everything this week. It's very enjoyable. I went deaf for just a little bit of that last song, but I got my hearing back again and I got most of it. I'd like to read something to begin with here that is an attempt to put into a little capsule what uh, we were trying to say this week. It is uh, on purpose to be precise and to be concise. And it has a footnote for practically every phrase. Satan's original charge was that the law of God could not be obeyed. When man broke the law of God, Satan rejoiced and added another charge, that man could not be forgiven. He had no idea that God would pay the penalty himself. But Jesus' life and death prove that sinners can be forgiven and that the law of God can be obeyed, not only by Jesus, but by those who live the life of faith as he did. This twofold message of forgiveness and obedience is the heart of the Roman mission during the time of the three angels and the final work of Christ in heaven. Jesus, as our high priest, provides forgiveness for sinners and power to obey. These two truths are equally necessary. It is extremely important that the remnant people understand this twofold work of Christ in heaven. Otherwise, it would be impossible for them to fulfill their mission. Justification by faith, God's work for us, and the righteousness of Christ, which includes God's work in us, are the two themes to be presented to a perishing world. Now, the nominal Christian world has for a long time had one half of it. One half of it. And there are voices today that want us to go back to only one half of it. But this is what makes you a Seventh-day Adventist, when you have both halves of this. And it's a very fascinating time to live. Well, uh, let's sing once more and uh, see how many hallelujahs we can have. We praise thee, O God, for the silent sidewalks and freeways and airplanes and all the rest of it. One of his interesting parables that deals with both aspects of the good news that we've tried to talk this week is found in Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Have you ever thought about going to a wedding naked? I suppose most of us have not struggled with that temptation too long. Uh, streaking was rather short-lived compared to other fads. It seemed like streaking would have been terribly hard on the nervous system. And uh, so most of us have not really entertained the thought or way awake at night considering going naked to a wedding. But uh, if this sounds a little racy, Consider the parable in all of its meaning, Matthew 22. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables, and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son. And he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. 
Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their way, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the women took his servants, and entreated them spitefully, and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And he sent forth his armies, and destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So the servants went out into the highways and gathered together all, as many as they found, both bad and good. That should include everybody. And the wedding was furnished with guests, <clears throat> but the plot thickens. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, How camest thou in heaven not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Or few choose to be chosen. What's Jesus trying to say here? Well, the first thing we need to notice is that Jesus was taking off on a custom in the days in which he lived, which was that if anyone of note put on a wedding for their son, particularly a king, not only was an invitation sent, but a wedding robe was sent as well. Now, if we got an invitation here today to the marriage of some king's son somewhere in this world, one of the first things that at least 50% of the gender would say would be, but I'm not telling you which percent, which half, or am I going to wear? And the king had already settled that problem in the days of Christ. Because with the invitation came a beautiful wedding garment, a wedding robe, that was furnished for all the guests. Now, as you know, a wedding is a highly personal affair. But people could be invited from all different walks of life. And it made no difference. Whether you were the butler, whether you were the man from the street, or were you from the king's court, Everyone, because of the road provided, could show up at the wedding looking like a millionaire. Now, to refuse the robe would be an insult to the king who sent the robe, right? To accept the invitation but refuse the robe would be an insult to the king, it would be an insult to the king's son, and in a sense the whole kingdom would feel the sting. And you have in the story a man who refused the robe. Well, you say he, he must have at least had on his jogging outfit or perhaps a sweatshirt and Levi's. No, if you go further into the story, you discover that in the spiritual analogy, including Revelation, the third chapter, a church called Laodicea, that the people are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and what? Naked. So I'm going to go so far as to take the risk and suggest that this man drive the streak to the wedding. Can you see him there, shifting from foot to foot in front of the king? And the king is so kind, he treats him with dignity, which he didn't really deserve. And he says, friend, friend, what happened? You know, obviously there's something wrong. <laughs> Seemed like most of us would have reacted in such a way that we would have tossed him out on a moment's notice. 
But no, he talks with them. He's his friend. <clears throat> Didn't the mail come? Didn't you get the parcel post package? Something wrong with the system? Do you have some explanation you'd like to make? And only then does this man get shown to the exit. Well, the second thing we need to notice about this parable is that Jesus was actually, in his usual style, hiding truth and revealing truth, which is his reason for talking in parables. And they're giving a picture of the Jewish nation and how that they had turned down the invitation to the marriage. And he had another parable that actually was the first cousin of this parable, in which they began to make the usual excuses, as you recall. And so, uh, when they had refused the invitation, it says that the king was wroth, sent forth his armies, destroyed the murderers, and burned up their city. Jesus even had a prediction in the parable of the destruction of Jerusalem. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. And right here we need to notice something fascinating. What is it that makes you worthy? What is it that makes you worthy? Have you ever heard the cliches? You can almost predict some prayers, the way they start and the way they will end. You can tell the next phrase that's coming. And then, Lord, at last, when thou comest in the clouds, grant that we without the loss of one. Have you ever heard these? May be what? Worthy. To have an abundant entrance into the, you know. And what do we think of when we hear that word? We may be worthy. Well, of course, legalists. We all have the disease deep in our bones. We immediately begin thinking of, I wonder if I'm going to be good enough to make it. It started in the cradle world in the kindergarten. Boys and girls, if you're good, then you will go to heaven. And so we immediately begin to measure ourselves by ourselves and we wonder if we're going to make it. And we wonder if we'll have enough time or if probation will close first. We begin to wonder when our names are coming up. Please notice that the only thing that made them worthy in the story was to accept the invitation. The reason they were not worthy is they did not accept the invitation. Does that sound a little better? So the servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found the gospel to the Gentiles, and that includes you and me down to the present moment, and gathered together as many as they found, both bad and good, Mine, I like that. I suppose we ought to have a show of hands here of all the good people so we can get a good uh, idea here of which ones are the bad ones and which ones are the good ones. How many good people are there? How many are there that are righteous according to Paul, Romans 3? There are how many righteous? There are none righteous, no, not one. So what would it have to be talking about? The bad people who are bad and the good people who are bad who think they're good. Wouldn't it? Because they're all bad. I understand we're all bad. That we do not... Uh, become sinners by sinning, that we sin because we were born sinners. Romans 5 makes that quite clear. I've heard people spend till midnight twisting their brains out of shape on that one. Do we sin because we are sinners, or are we sinners because we sin? That'll keep you going. And I believe the Bible is very clear on the point that we are born separated from God. That's the problem of being born sinners. 
And as a result, the first symptom of that is that we're born self-centered. And self-centeredness is the root of all the sins that follow. We're all bad. And even those who have accepted Jesus and are in his salvation are still sinners by nature. And we will confess, confess the sinfulness of our nature until Jesus comes. Even the holiest men of old did that. But whatever all this means, both bad and good, it at least tells you one thing, that we're all included in the invitation. Everyone here today. you believe that? And the invitation to be present at the marriage supper is open for all. Here you have, if you please, the truth of justification. Jesus at the cross purchased the right to forgive anyone and give them a seat at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Well, probably we ought to take a look at that. Our scripture lesson of a moment ago reminded us of that, but let's get the eschatological setting. Revelation 19. Notice it again because here you have the scriptural interpretation taking it down to your day and my day. Revelation 19, verse 6, I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, thine the glory. <laughs> that would be a good place, wouldn't it? For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come. Who is the Lamb? Jesus. And his wife hath made herself ready. Who is the wife? The church. And to her is granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen. Here is the robe. Clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. That's King James. The new international version. The fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And that's what most of the new versions say. Something relative to the righteous deeds, the acts of the saints. Obviously, the righteousness of Christ worked out in the life. Not just the righteousness of Christ for us, but the righteousness of Christ in us. The two things to be presented to a perishing world. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, the next thing we need to notice is that this marriage supper takes place pre-advent. Pre-advent. Check Revelation 19, its context. Check Jesus and his story in Matthew 22. And as you follow through this whole story of the marriage supper of the Lamb, you are taken right into Jesus' own teaching on the pre-Advent judgment. You know, some of us became so frustrated at PUC. With all of the uh, theological milieu and all of the discussions, and all of the scholars saying different things, and let's face it, that's happening today. That uh, we said the typical layman is in trouble. I mean, it's a good question when the layman on the pews say, if the scholars can't get it all together, what are we supposed to do? That's a fair question. And uh, I'm very sympathetic with the layman. In fact, I am a layman. And I would like to be considered as a layman. And as a layman, I insist that I can find answers that do not depend upon someone else. It's too long we depend on someone else. And it's too bad when we get shook when some big voice goes out. 
I have a lot of admiration for HMS Richards. But if Richards leaves the faith and starts smoking cigars and opens up a gambling joint in Las Vegas, I hope that my faith in Jesus will go straight ahead. Of course we are disappointed when bright lights get shaken, but it should make no difference in our faith. And so we insist on having some method of finding the answers that don't depend upon someone else. And then to our surprise and our joy, we found out that the best interpretation of Scripture comes from the layman under the influence of the Holy Spirit, that the Bible was not written for the scholar alone. Well, one day we were sort of gazing at the ceiling and shifting from foot to foot, and the thought came, well, why don't we go to the teachings of Jesus and see what he has to say about the current issues? And to our surprise, when we started through the Gospels, phrase by phrase, and began to ask what Jesus had to say about justification, sanctification, faith relationship, perfection, the nature of Christ, we discovered that Jesus had the answers on all of them. We found that Jesus has the answers on the judgment and on the prophets. They're all in Jesus' teachings. And Jesus' teachings are so simple that a child can understand that they're so profound that the most sophisticated can be challenged. Isn't that so? Now, I like to study Paul, but I like to study Jesus better. Paul said some things hard to be understood. And I know it's a sophisticated thing to be into Paul, you know. I'm studying Paul, yeah. And that's great. I still like Jesus better. And I'm going to tell you something. If Paul was here, I think he'd join me. Don't you think so? So Jesus taught the pre-advent judgment. Here it is. Let's take a little closer look. Here everyone is at the marriage supper. All have been invited, both good and bad. And the king comes in to see the guests. The king comes in to examine the guests. Shall we go so far as to say the king comes in to investigate the guests? And he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. What is the wedding garment? The righteous acts of the saints. The righteous deeds of the saints suggesting the righteousness of Christ in us, suggesting sanctification. But where do the saints get their righteousness? They are incapable of producing it. Jeremiah 23, it's always the Lord our righteousness. And so he says to him, A friend, I'm glad for that. He's very kind, friend. How camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? He was speechless. Revelation 3 5 talks about this too. He that overcometh shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. There you have sanctuary language again, and judgment language. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Or someone says, wait a minute, preacher. You're going into the things that I've been afraid of. You're going into the things for which people are changing their theology today. You're taking away my assurance. You're taking away my certainty. You're talking to me about overcoming. Well, welcome to the club.
If you get nervous, so do I. But I'd like to remind you, if overcoming was my work, then there would be nothing but hopelessness. The truth is that overcoming is Jesus' work, and that has evaded us. There have been voices that have insisted that our justification is by faith alone, and we've had some really rocking of the ship on that point. But perhaps we needed to take a long look at that. One of the problems in our church, going way back, is that we early took for granted the cross and justification. We took it for granted, and we began to go and to press our way toward what we felt was our mission, to defend the law of God and all the commandments and the Sabbath. And along about... Uh, at the end of the last century, a little lady began saying things like, we have preached the law until we are dry as the hills of Gilboa. And she rebuked us for it. You people who are unfriendly toward this little lady, she's one of the best friends you ever had. So we have had a problem with an unbalanced emphasis in the past, and there are people who have felt the cross has almost been totally left out, and as a result we've had a backlash now, and the backlash has been right in the pendulum clear to the other side, where it's the cross and the cross only, and forget about anything else. Have you seen it happen? That's what's happening. Let's give priority emphasis to the invitation, it's free, it's for all, both bad and good. But you cannot, if you're going to be honest with Scripture, you cannot deny that there is a robe, and the robe has to do with overcoming, it has to do with righteousness in the life. And the man, when he was asked about it, was speechless. Usually when a person is speechless, it's because he has nothing to say. Nothing to say. And only then was he dismissed from the marriage. Well, now we've got to uh, work on this just a little bit. If our hope of eternal life is based totally upon what Jesus did at the cross, What does this overcoming have to do with it? It kind of reminds you of the evangelist of old who said, we do not get to heaven by keeping the Sabbath, but we can't get to heaven if we don't. We don't get to heaven by putting on the robe, but we can't get to heaven if we don't. Is this diluting the gospel of God's free grace and justification? Perhaps a little illustration will help at uh, Pacific Union College. I haven't had a chance to check at Union yet, but they, uh, they hire professors to teach there on the basis of their expertise, their training, their degree, their study. They invite them to come, and that's the basis of their invitation to come and teach there. But every professor who comes to teach at PUC has to take a TB test. Because it just so happens that the board and the faculty of PUC administration doesn't want any professor going around the campus coughing and sneezing TB terms all over the campus. The uh, TB test has nothing to do with the basis on which he's invited to come teach there. But the TB test in passing it is a condition for teaching there. Now, the invitation that Jesus gives to everyone to come to the marriage of the Lamb is based totally upon what Jesus has done. And what Jesus has done is enough for the basis of the invitation. 
It just so happens that God doesn't want people coughing and sneezing and sin germs all over his universe. And so he has made putting on the robe as a condition for entrance there. Well, you say, uh, regardless of how you explain it, it still comes out the same. Right? It still comes out the same. There goes my assurance. I guess I'll scrap my Adventist theology and bring my theology down to match my experience. Except for there's one thing. There's one thing that we have missed. Seventh-day Adventists have missed it. The Christian world has missed it. Once in a while, we bewait ourselves for not having finished the work of God. Well, I'd like to give you some cheap comfort. Nobody else has finished it either. And we're all in the same boat on this one. And I want to propose to you that the truth of what I'm going to either shout or whisper next is the truth that is part and parcel of the loud cry message in the latter rain. I wish there was some way with all of the oratorio and ability of all of the greats of the past to say it that it would fill this room. And that's why I don't know whether to shout it or whisper it or to wait for five minutes in silence before I say it. It demands every technique, but above all, it demands the Holy Spirit's power. And it's this. The wedding garment is just as free as the invitation. Did you hear that? The wedding garment is just as free as the invitation. We've missed that. If the wedding garment was something I had to produce myself, and there was never any garment ever before made like it, and it had to be perfect, then you could say, when the invitation came, forget it, I'm not going to the wedding at all. But the wedding garment is free. It's a gift. That's why the man was speechless. What are we saying by that? that sanctification is just as much a gift as is justification. Obedience is just as much a gift as is forgiveness. Victory is a gift. Overcoming is a gift. It is not something you achieve. It is something you receive. That has missed us. And it has been trying to surface for some time now. And if you think we've had ebb and flow over the question of justification... Just stand by for the ebb and flow over this one. It's a big one. Because many people are willing to accept God's grace in terms of the invitation will refuse the wedding garment because they want to weave themselves into the work. That's why strong people in the church are the ones who are threatened by the message of the totality of the righteousness of Christ. And that's why we have strong people, self-disciplined people, who say... Yes, we can only enter heaven on the basis of the cross, but when it comes to living the Christian life, you've got to do, do your part. You've got to do your part. You have to work hard at it and let God do what you can't do. You've got to use your grit and your willpower and your backbone to obey and try to overcome and get the victory. And that's why the ground has been fertile for a new theology. I wish I could say it 50 times in 50 different ways. The robe is as free as the invitation. Will you remember that phrase this week? The reason we have not overcome, and therefore the reason why we have to drag down our theology to our level, and why we have to get rid of the judgment, and get rid of perfection, and get rid of Ellen White, and all the rest of it, is because we have not seen this point. That the robe is as free as the invitation. Yeah. 
Now, how that works out in real life needs to be explained. I would like to make a feeble attempt the rest of the week to get into that so we can see where the rubber meets the road and get into the nitty-gritty of what we mean by the road being as free as the invitation. But in the meantime, I would like to invite you to RSVP. RSVP, whatever that means. The King is inviting you to the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's pre-Advent, the part that we're talking about with the robe. And he says, as he sends the invitation, will you please RSVP? Could I suggest a typical RSVP that some might give, too many might give, to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? I received a pressing invitation to be present at the marriage supper of your Son, Jesus. I pray thee, have me excused. Or, to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, I have just received your urgent invitation to be present at the marriage supper of your only begotten Son. I hasten to reply. By the grace of God, I'll be there. P.S. And thank you for the beautiful robe. Shall we pray? Dear Father in heaven, don't let us alone until we understand what all this means. Forgive us for our lack of understanding. And accept our gratitude for your mighty patience with us. And help us today to see clearly the beauty of the invitation and the beauty of the robe, all provided by Jesus. We ask in his name. Amen.